Okay, so we are now going to develop our uh, an actual migration method that is still used for, uh, for zero offset data stack sections um, for uh, uh, marine data, uh, single channel marine data. Um, it's not only practical; um, it, uh, it it it's still useful even even these days. So a lot of a lot of what we what we're going to develop are methods that are very very simple. Have these you know kind of overwhelmingly simple assumptions. But if you're sitting you know in the in the doghouse uh, uh, in your in your field recording, um, and uh, uh, and you don't know anything about the velocity yet, right? Because you haven't done all the analysis. You just want to see. Are we seeing anything with today's data? Okay, and and nowadays, uh, you know, you can just uh, hit a few buttons, point to a few things on the screen in your in your doghouse, and you can, you know, take uh, the records that you just recorded, and you can you can do a real quick, you know, back of the envelope analysis it's called a you know a brute stack, and and this uh, phase shift migration is still used as a brute migration because. Uh, Having so many assumptions also means that uh, you know if you don't know exactly what you have, it may work as well as anything else. You know until you until you define uh, precisely those uh, lateral velocity transitions, um, this uh, this migration might uh, might do as good a job as the fancy one. You know, in fact, the fancy one is probably going to utterly fail because it, it has all this other input that it needs to have, and you don't know that yet. If you're just at the end of the day's recording, right? And you're, uh, you know, you may be, uh, you may be in a bar in um, uh, in Wells, Nevada, and uh, you know, you don't want to take uh, uh, twenty hours to uh, to pick all the. Uh, I mean, you've 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 probably just sent all your records to. Uh, uh, to the uh, the picking shop in India, and 20 hours later they will come back with the 100,000 picks uh, and the and the velocity model. But uh, you know when you're when you're in the bar in, in Wells, Nevada, thinking about um, uh, how you're going to shoot the next day, and if there's targets down there that you may not be covering quite well enough, um, you know you might want to do something that's uh, uh, that's really quick and will at least show you if there's anything to see. And that's that's why these uh, you know the phase shift migration, the Stolt migration, uh, the Kirchhoff migration that we'll cover here are still used. They uh, you know until until uh, you know those hundred people in India have been grinding away at it for twenty hours. This is the best you can get, and it and it works pretty well. So we're on page forty five uh, in the notes. Uh, this is the beginning of uh, notes number nineteen. And um, so uh, the title in the notes, uh, FK migration, uh, is um, a clue that this phase shift migration is our first example of a, an FK frequency wave number domain migration using the Fourier transform. All right, so we, we have defined our downward continuation. OK. Um, oh, and yeah, I got to credit to uh, Gazdag. Who published this in 1978? He developed it earlier, and and kind of in the, you know, intellectually, this is an earlier development. Uh, but as you'll see, he actually published this uh, a little bit after uh, Stolt published his. So he he kind of lost the competition, but he gets uh, he still gets full credit. Okay, so uh, here's our downward continued data volume. This is our wave field. Uh, in X and T, zero offset wave field, you know, just as we re recorded in the field, perhaps, uh, at least with a say with a chirp survey, but it's been downward continued to a whole range of different z values. Okay, with the uh, uh, as if the the survey had been had been sunk into the ground at, at these different z values, and seen the exploding reflectors uh, from different levels, and so we get that by uh, by taking the the field. Data, okay, um, and uh, and that's uh, the field data is a wave field P, which is at depth z equals zero, and then we 
Um, we Fourier transform into two dimensions, which yesterday I explained how to do, even for an enormous data set. And so now, instead of being in x and t, um, it's in kx and omega. Okay, and then we uh, multiply by this imaginary uh, uh, exponential, e to the i k sub z times z. Okay, and so obviously z is the uh, the level that we we want to have, and. Um, uh, and what is k sub z? Well, that comes from the dispersion relation, and uh, it's uh, uh, so it's just the semicircle uh, where we have the uh, square root of omega squared over v squared minus k x squared, and um, and that gives us k sub z. Uh, why again are we using the negative sign here? Why are we using the negative k sub z? Does anybody remember? From our discussion of the dispersion relation, uh, that's like two weeks ago now. Um, does uh, which direction are we? Which direction of wave propagation are we using here? The negative is is upward, right? Well, it's 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 as time increases, z decreases. So you're right about. You're right about it in that sense, but uh, uh, it's it's upward, okay. And we're doing that because we're using the exploding reflector model. So the waves are, you know, we think the reflectors are below us, and the waves are propagating up towards the surface. So that's why we have the negative sign there. Okay, so uh, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we downward continue the data into um, in in this part here. That gets us to some non-zero z, right? And what's the rest of this? The two integrals, these two exponentials here, that's just a 2D inverse Fourier transform. So we go to a certain, you know, we set z equal to some constant, and we have a, a 2D Fourier transform, so, and then we multiply by this e to the i case of z times z. It's just a, a real mild phase shift filter. You know, it's, a, it's an all-pass filter. It's a phase shift filter. It moves the waves around. Doesn't subtract or add any any uh, um, uh, any energy, so that's what we want to do. Um, and then uh, uh, and then we have a two D field, which is k x at a, at this. Now it's at this particular z and omega, and we want to to inverse transform it to uh, x t, and it's a two D wave field. In, at that particular z, and that's going to become one slice of the uh, of the whole volume, right? Which is at many different levels of z. Okay, so so we're going to creep down from the top in increments delta z. So we're going to find the wave field. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the wave field, uh, the two D wave field at zero depth. We're going to multiply it by e to the i k sub z times Delta z, right? Might be one meter. Might be, uh, I suppose, for a crustal scale survey, you would use a hundred meters delta z. Um, kind of that. This is going to be our our depth pixelation in uh, uh, in our final product in our final image. Okay, so we we uh, we creep down from zero to delta z, right? And we get the two D wave field that's at delta z, and it's. Uh, uh, and it's still in kx and omega, right? Still in the 2D Fourier domain. So at this depth, at, at this new depth delta z, we image all the exploding reflectors at t equals zero. Okay. So um, uh, we take this. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we've we've done this inner part here that I'm swiping over, and we need to do the the inverse 2D Fourier transform, right? Um, and so let me pull out half of that inverse 2D Fourier transform. I'll pull out this first integral here, and it's going to be the one. Uh, uh, and I'll pull out the. Uh, um, I'll pull out the e to the i. Uh, I'm sorry, e to the minus i omega t. Okay, so there's the e to the minus i omega t, right? And that's an integration over d omega, and that's a an integral over all omega, right? And I'm saying, well, I need to image it at t equals zero. So 
if, if I take e to the i omega t and I put in t equals 0, then I get e to the 0, which is just 1, right? And so really, and, but I still have the in integration there, right? So really, uh, uh, I have uh, um, what, I, what I'm just doing is I'm integrating over omega. I'm just adding up all of the values at the different, at the different frequencies. Okay? So, so I'm integrating over omega. I'm summing over omega. What's, what's that going to do? That reduces this, right? This started as a, as a two-dimensional wave field at, uh, at depth uh, now delta z after multiplying by this, right? Um, and, and if I integrate over omega, that reduces, that takes out the omega, um, the omega axis. So really, what I've done is... Um, is is I've I've reduced it down to one trace, or it's actually one row at at this. So this is now in terms of kx, it's at depth delta z, and it's uh, uh, it's at uh, uh, it's at t equals zero. So this is uh, this is one row at one delta z. Uh, it's uh, it's not two dimensional anymore because it's just at at t equals zero, right? It's already been integrated over all the frequencies. So, so what's left now? Uh, I have the the integral um, that takes it from k. The integral that's the inverse Fourier transform from kx to x. Okay. So we take this this one trace, right? And we do this one d inverse Fourier transform. From kx to x uh, by integrating over all, all kx. So what does that get me? That gets me, you know, in my in my model, that gets me one level at this level delta z. Okay. Um, so now I can go back to um, uh, to this step. And I can multiply by e to the i k z uh, delta z again. Okay, so I can keep looping through and 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 get as many levels as I like. And you know, notice I'm multiplying by this original un, my, un this original Fourier transform data set. Okay, so I'm I'm just uh, I'm just. Uh, 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 I'm building up the uh, the multiplications by e to the i k z times delta z. Okay. Um, and then every time I every time I get to a new level, I I have to sum up all the frequencies. You know, it's that's like a stack. That's how this is actually kind of like a like a stack. You're stacking instead of stacking over x, you're you're or or offset. You're stacking over frequencies. Just add them up. Okay, and uh, and you get one trace. You know, a stack starts with with a whole two D record and gives you one trace. Okay, and uh, so you could call this frequency stacking if you like. And that one trace is one level uh, in your in your image. Okay, and you don't have to go you don't have to go back and find the you know we're we're always using the same you know, we got to hold this. 2D Fourier transform of our of our original data, you know that's going to take the most space, and we and we're going to build up an image. So we got to have room in our computer for two copies of our final image. That's not too bad. Uh, that you know we should these days we should be able to do that on a on an Android or a, or an iPhone. <laughs> there's there's plenty of plenty of memory for that. Um, okay. Uh, now we can we can in we can do an inverse migration using Gazdag's phase shift technique, um, just by reversing the uh, uh, the above procedure. We can we can march up from the maximum depth we have and get to zero. Um, and and we have to use you know when we do this multiplication by e to the i k z times delta z, we got to use negative delta z to do. Um, to do upward uh, uh, instead of downward continuation, it's upward continuation. Okay. Um, 
Now, why, why does anybody still use this? Okay? And the reason is, is that um, uh, in, in, most, in most prospects, most places that we're doing surveying and trying to image, velocity varies a lot vertically. Okay, now this obviously can't handle any lateral variations in velocity, and we're still assuming that. But uh, you know, it's like, it's like here in the Reno Basin, between the uh, you know, say ten meters depth and uh, and the basement, velocity, the p velocity can go up by a factor of five. Okay, so it, it can be quite severe. Um, factor three is not unusual at all, and even a factor of five is possible. So um, uh, we really do, you know, in calculating kz here, right? And the only thing we 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 don't know here is is the velocity v. But we're doing that at every we're doing that independently at every depth level. So we can use at every different depth level, we can use a different velocity if we want, and it works perfectly. Okay, so we can have as bizarre a velocity change as we want vertically. Can't have any uh, can't have any uh, lateral changes in velocity, but but see, velocity is just plugged in here, and it's at a specific z level. Okay, or at least we you know we keep track of where we are in z, and we plug in a different velocity. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's why this this is still a very uh, a very well used method because often often you know even sitting in a bar in wells. You do have uh, some idea of how much the velocity changes vertically. You don't get you know until they're until they're done picking those hundred thousand uh, first arrivals or doing the uh, migration velocity analysis. You have no idea how velocity varies uh, laterally, but uh, but you can take a, a really good educated guess in most areas about how it varies vertically. So that's uh, uh, that's why this is still uh, quite a popular method. Um, and uh, and and this ease of you know especially where you have some foreknowledge, this ease of of uh, putting in the you know as complicated a lateral velocity variation as you want, is is really the the key. Now remember, uh, this uh, uh, v here, that's the half velocity, right? Because we're still using the exploding reflector model. But you know the half velocity can vary as well. All right. So now let's uh, let's go to the most popular method and the simplest. I mean, this this basically allows you so little flexibility that uh, it has the the brilliant um, uh, the brilliant effect of working better than anything until you get everything right. Until you have all of that three D velocity control. You know, and you've characterized very well all the lateral velocity variations. In my experience, you won't get anything any better than than the Stolt migration will give you. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, it's it's kind of amazing that way. Um, you know, so so it really uh, uh, it really will it it'll, it'll work. It'll you know if if velocity varies with depth, it's going to give you strongly. It's going to give you the wrong depth. That's okay. I mean. You just want to see if you can image some things, right? You're, you're, uh, you know, you got to get up at four o'clock the next morning for the next day's shoot, um, you know, west of Wells, uh, which I think, uh, hope, but they'll probably have shot it by the time you start uh, working for them. In in uh, east of east of Elko, they are, yeah. But I don't know if they started shooting uh, west of Wells though. Okay, yeah. So you you may get to do that. You know, we'll see. We'll see. Um, and uh, uh, you know, maybe if you're just in the in the basin, there's a very deep. There's like an eight kilometer deep basin uh, west of Wells, and if you're out in that, then um, uh, stolt migration will work as well as anything because the velocity variation is is pretty gentle in the basin. Um, and it's pretty automatic, you know. You just you don't have to you 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 
you you guess at one velocity value. That's all you got to give it, you know. And then there's the uh, the parameters of the survey. You know what the spacing of the what the time spacing is, what the x spacing is. That's that's all it needs to know. And then you, it just does it. Okay. So uh, why is it so simple? All right. Um, and uh, so let's see. This is published also in Geophysics by Stolt in '78, and it's in volume. So that's volume 43. It's on page 23. And Gazdags is uh, like uh, there were at that time there were about 300, two or 300 pages per issue of Geophysics. So Gazdag was late in the year, and Stolt was early in the year. So he beat him to it by a few issues. <laughs> um, Okay, so 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 uh, Stolt started essentially with gas dags. Uh, I don't know if the guys were working in parallel, if they were you know independent of each other, or if they knew what each other were doing. I don't know that that fact. Um, I don't think either of them are still around. So, but I could, I should ask Claire about a little more about the history because he he was around to watch this happening. Um, so. Uh, 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 okay, here's our downward continuation, right? We have a 2D section that has been downward continued to one level z, right? So, uh, um, and then by making a whole bunch of 2D sections, we can get all the z levels and finally get this whole volume, okay? And there's our input data already Fourier transformed in two dimensions from t to omega and x to kx. And there's our downward continuation. Um, Filter e to the i k sub z times z, and then here's the inverse 2D Fourier transform e to the i k sub x times x and e to the minus i omega t. Okay, and we um, we apply the uh, exploding reflector imaging condition, and for mathematical reasons that I'm not sure I entirely understand, what we're going to say is that our reflectivity section. Uh, which is going to be our cross section in x and z is the limit as t goes to zero of our of our data as t goes to zero from positive time, not from negative time, but from positive time of our data um, our downward continued data volume, which is uh, in in x z and t. Okay, so here is that that expression for the downward continued data. Okay, so we've made this equivalence, and we've we've applied the limit. Okay, um, and so instead of p x z t, we have r of x and z. So our reflectivity section, our our model space, is here's the same thing, right? There's the there's the Fourier transform surface data at z equals zero. There's the uh, the um, there's the uh, uh, e to the i k z times z. There's the the downward continuation exponential. There's the uh, the inv the exponential for the inverse Fourier transform from k x to x, and here was the exponential of the inverse Fourier transform from o omega to t. Okay, but Stolt realized you know with that limit, you could just take it directly to zero. Okay. You could take it directly to zero, um, uh, t directly to zero here, and so suddenly this exponential drops out. Now we still got, you know, we still got both integrals here. We still got the integration over kx, the integration over over omega, right? And we still got our kx to x. Obviously, in, underlined in green is the inverse Fourier transform uh, exponential and and uh, the dkx. And the integral, I should have underlined uh, the uh, one of the integrals too, uh, in green, you know, for um, uh, for the inverse transform from kx to x. But instead of instead of a an inverse transform from, uh, but we have this other exponential here. This is obviously the downward continuation. Now I've put in the definition of kz and I made it negative, right? So that's minus i times z times the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared, right? So that's kz. Okay. Now, now, down below, I've written an inverse Fourier transform from some function capital F, which is uh, in kx and kz, 
right? And this is the inverse Fourier transform to the 2D uh, function in x and z. And it's like we got all the pieces here, but it's not quite right, right? We've got uh, the the kx part is wired. We got you know our functions in kx. We've got the inverse transform uh, exponential and the inverse transform integration. You know over over all kx. Okay. Now we'd like to have kz, right? Because if we had kz instead, we have omega, right? Uh, if we had kz, then then we could use the fast Fourier transform, right? Uh, you know already, you know the green can be done with the fast Fourier transform, uh, and and if this if it looked like this, right, e to the i k z times z instead of this thing up here, you know with with uh, with this weird definition for k z, right, the dispersion relation. If it was just k z, right, uh, and we had k z here instead of omega, then we could. Um, uh, then we could use a, 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 uh, an inverse fast Fourier transform uh, from kz to z. So all this is, you know, all I want to do here is take this omega and I want to change variables to kz. Okay, so um, then I can just use an inverse fast Fourier transform in two dimensions. You know, otherwise I've got this. Uh, this nasty integral over this weird exponential, right? We have to solve it the way Gazdag did by summing the frequencies and all that business. Okay. So let's, uh, you know, and 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 how does kz relate to omega? Well, through the dispersion relation, right? Very easy. So uh, you know, here's uh, kz. The definition of kz is equal to minus the the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. We can solve this for omega, right? So omega is equal to v times the square root of kx squared plus kz squared. And if we're going to change variables, we also need the Jacobian, right? We need d omega dkz. So here it is, v times the, uh, uh, the magnitude of kz divided by the, um, uh, the square root of the quantity kx squared plus kz squared. Okay, So we're going to make a substitution into this equation up here, number equation number one. All right, so it's gonna we're gonna get to, so we make the substitution in, and uh, and what we end up with is this Q thing. It's not quadrature. Sorry, that's repeated uh, notation. Um, it's just the uh, 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 the the mapped the the uh, the mapping from omega to kz. Okay. And this, this q function is uh, in terms of kx and kz. And then look at the exponentials we have. Okay, We have uh, e to the i kx x and e to the i kz uh, times z. And so this is a, a perfect you know, fast Fourier trans transformable 2D uh, inverse, transform, inverse Fourier transform. Okay. So now the details here, you know, what is Q? Okay, so Q's in kx and kz, and it's, there's the jo Jacobian. And I'm telling you now, this is what's referred to in the exercises for lab six as the obliquity factor. Okay, um, so uh, uh, you know, you can see this is this is purely an amplitude adjustment. All right, and then um, here is the uh, the the remapped. Um, a wave field, right? It's in kx z equals zero, uh, and then uh, we pick up, you know, we calculate omega, right? We know, you know, we're looping through here. We know kx, we know kz. We we have to assume some velocity or put in some velocity, right? And uh, uh, and then with that we calculate omega equal to v times the quantity, uh, the square root of the quantity kx squared plus kz squared. So this is a mapping, and this is called an omega stretch. You know, we're taking this wave field, which is in omega, and you can kind of envision stretching it out from omega to kz. You know, kind of stretching the axis. Okay. So uh, depending on what the kx and kz are, and what the velocity is, you know, we're going to go. We're going to land on this certain omega. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, okay, let me explain that mapping a little bit. The omega stretch is a mapping from the omega to kx axis. So we Fourier transformed the uh, the field data, right? It was in x and t, and now it's in it's a wave field in kx and omega, right? There's kx, there's omega, and um, so uh, uh, we could do a forward mapping. We could go through. We could loop through all the uh, all the different values in our in our Fourier transformed image. And uh, you know, each one there's a there's a Fourier transform value. It's a complex, just a complex number, right? And we want to know where you know where do we put that in the new map, right? Here's the new map. It's in kz and kx. The kx doesn't change, right? So we're you know we're working on this row here or this column here, which is at you know at this one kx value, and we uh, we want to know okay where do we put it in this row here? It's at the same kx. But it's going to go from some omega location to some kz location, all right. And here's here's how we um, um, here's how we uh, um, uh, how we would calculate that. We would say, all right, I'm at uh, I'm at this. You know, I, I want this. I'm going to work on where does this spot go, okay? And um, and so uh, I know what omega I'm at. I know what kx I'm at. I know what what velocity I'm assuming, right? So I just calculate kz, and I take I pick up that amplitude, and I put it there. Okay, so that's a that's a mapping. It's just a stretch, you know. And it's only it, I'm not stretching kx. I'm only stretching uh, omega. And I'm stretching it into uh, into kz. Um, now, uh, what I just described. Is what I call uh, an input-based mapping, okay? And and there remains the problem, right? You could be here, and and you know you're looping through all the values of your input uh, field, and the kz calculates to be, um, well, it's going to be negative, right? Maybe it calculates to be positive. Okay, or maybe it's more negative than your than the the most negative kz that you have. Okay, so uh, uh, so you're just forced to throw that data away, right? Because we we don't we can't put it over here, we can't put it over here. You know what do we do with it? Likewise, you know if we did this this forward mapping, this input based mapping, we might find well you know I I kind of I kind of hit every other point. And so then I have what looks like a comb function in the in the uh, in the remap data. It doesn't look like a stretch at all. It's a it's kind of like a stretch with holes. Okay, that can happen too. So the way I the way I really do it, and this is the way the program does it, we use a, what's called an output output based mapping. So we start over here, and we loop through kz. We loop through all val all possible values of kx, and then we for each Value of kx, we loop through all possible values of kz, at least the ones we're keeping, and we go the other way. So we have, we're here. We know kx, we know kz, okay. We know our velocity, and we use the the inverse of the equation, right? We solve for omega, and then we go back to the, we get that omega. We go back to the to the to the same uh, kx trace, okay, and we say, all right, it's here at this omega. And then almost always, right? This it ends up being between two points, right? You know, we may have uh, we may have a value at uh, um, well, it's on omega axis, so we may have a value at ten hertz, and we have another value at ten point one hertz, another value at ten point two hertz, okay? And and what we'll calculate is ten point oh eight five, okay? So uh, we use a linear interpolation. Uh, and and if you want it to be even better, you can use you know spline interpolations and fancier things. So uh, you know we we're we're here. We're looping through. We're going to get the value for exactly this point, exactly this kx and kz. We'll come back. We'll find uh, you know where do we pick up the the amplitude? Okay, and it's halfway in between. So we average the two points that are around it. You know the, the and we average both the real and the imaginary. Okay. And that's the value we add in. Okay, we start with this whole field being zero, 
and we loop through it, and there's going to be something, you know, maybe the the omega points to back to negative omega, or 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 uh, well, that's okay. Maybe it points to um, an omega that's beyond the limits, you know, beyond the Nyquist, and then we we end up we add in zero. So that output-based mapping makes sure there's no holes, there's no rips in our in our stretch surface. So it's like uh, you know doing the omega stretch with better elasticity, I guess. Okay. So uh, uh, I don't do it this way. I do it this way down here. I calculate omega and I go back and pick that up into the output. All right. Now what about the obliquity factor? Okay. Um, here's a uh, here's a what we got right. Um, we're in the kx kz plane, right? And we um, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, uh, we have v times uh, 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 the absolute value of kz divided by the uh, divided by the um, uh, divided by uh, the square root of the quantity kx squared plus kz squared. Okay. Well, you know the length of this vector, right? Let's say we're on kx and kz here, right? The length of this vector is the square root of kx squared plus kz squared. Okay. And then and then kz over that is um, the cosine. Of uh, yeah, there's kz, right? It's the cosine of this angle theta in here. Okay, uh, so v cosine theta is is what our what our obliquity factor really is. Okay, and um, so uh, uh, let's see if um, uh, and and this kx kz plane that's an indication this theta. That's the angle of propagation of the wave. Okay. Now, if with our okay, so so theta is zero at the top here, right? If we're on the kz axis, then uh, um, then these are equal, right? And the uh, uh, the cosine of zero is one, right? So that's uh, uh, that's one. Um, so the obliquity factor is one, right? Here's here's what's going to come out of the of the migration, right? This is all real, right? So this, the the obliquity factor is a real amplitude adjustment factor, okay? Now, uh, so where the angle of propagation of the wave is zero, we get full strength, and then what happens if it's ninety, right? Uh, at 90, kz is zero, right? We're out here. Kz is zero. Kx is something, okay? So um, uh, that means uh, uh, theta is 90, and uh, uh, the cosine of 90 degrees is um, is zero. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So. Um, uh, What's uh, you know what's going on there? Okay, the obliquity factor is zero at ninety degrees uh, propagation angle, and so there will be nothing left at ninety degrees propagation angle. There won't be anything there. The the, the obliquity factor you know forces it to be zero. Okay, so what it, what is this? Um, um, uh, um, If uh, uh, under the exploding reflector model, the uh, the angle of propagation is equal to something important, it's equal to the angle of dip. Um, and maybe I have to I have to draw that on the board. Um, okay, so we have uh, we have our landscape. And we have our seismic uh, survey, okay. And we have a flat reflector, and it explodes, okay. And these waves come straight up, right? 
the flat reflector explodes, the waves come straight up, the angle of propagation is, is zero degrees from vertical. All right? So at, at 90 degrees angle of propagation, okay, the waves are, are coming like this. That's 90 degrees angle of propagation. So the exploding reflector is what? It's, also, it's dipping 90 degrees. Okay, and uh, so, but the obliquity factor is for 90 degrees propagation is zero. So that means that Stolt migration is not going to see the 90 degree dipping reflectors. It's going to zero them out. Okay, and if it's, you know, halfway, right, uh, Let's see, the cosine of 30 degrees is, uh, is 1 half, is that right? Or is it 60 degrees, it's 1 half. The cosine of 30 degrees, let's see, 60. No, the cosine of 60 degrees is half. So if we have a 60 degree dipping reflector that explodes, right? Um, OK, so that's uh, 60 degrees, OK? Then the obliquity factor is going to be half. So our, you know, even under the best of conditions, a 60 degree dipping reflector is going to have half the amplitude of a flat reflector. So there, you know, the obliquity factor is forcing us, you know, to uh, emphasize low dips. Okay, which is one of the limitations of uh, of uh, of of the uh, uh, of of this migration. And one of the reasons why it's so simple, okay. Okay, so here's the here's the algorithm, okay. Very simple, and you and you know, in the book, uh, there's a uh, there's like a five line program that does all of this. Um, I mean, it calls other routines like like the two D F F T, but it's like five lines of of uh, Rat four. Which is simplified Fortran, um, and in my Java code, it's a couple hundred lines. It takes care of everything. Okay, not a very complicated program. So you do a two D FFT of the surface data, and you know we know how to we know how to do that to a huge data set now. You map you do the uh, omega stretch that maps from the wave field in kx and omega to the uh, Fourier transform of the of the migrated section in kx and kz, and you apply the obliquity factor. So there's all the conversions. This is the the output base mapping, and here's the obliquity factor. I forgot to put the uh, absolute value bars around kz. Okay, then you do a 2D inverse FFT. Okay, uh, and uh, so you go from q at kx and kz to the reflectivity section R of X and Z. Okay, and there's just a reminder. You know, this mapping that doesn't take much, right? You just got to loop over each each sample in the 2D section in KX and KZ. So that's not bad. Um, it's the the computations in the 2D FFTs. Okay, but we know how to do uh, FFTs pretty fast. Here's uh, Stoltz, uh, an example from Stoltz's paper. Here's the, the cross section with the real, you know, an X and Z with the real structure. Here's the time data showing the, the bow ties, right, at, for each level. And then here's his, uh, his migration. Okay. Notice that everything is constant velocity, so it works, it works rather perfectly. But there's still, you can see artifacts in here. Okay. It's not, not perfect. Um, you you know you should be familiar with the uh, effect of velocity on migration. Okay, so here again is the cross section. There's the seismograms with the 2D survey with the diffractions, right from the the faults where the stratigraphy is terminated with the faults. You can see the diffractions are overlapping. Um, and here's the migration with the correct velocity. Okay, if the velocity is a little too low. It's it's called under migrated, 
And you can see there's still you know, vesti vestigial uh, diffraction hyperbolas pointing down. If we use too high a velocity, it's called over-migrated. It's like it's been collapsed to the, uh, uh, to the point and then spreads up from there, and it's smiling up. Okay, over-migrated, the velocity is a little bit too high. And you know, ten percent. I mean, that's 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 pretty good for. I mean, we 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 have to do a lot of work to get our velocity within ten percent accuracy. We've got to collect a lot of data. So yeah, these are these are very common artifacts to see from salt migration. Here's a uh, an ancient uh, uh, example. There's a uh, salt layer down here. This is uh, unmigrated on top, zero offset data, a stack, uh, migrated on the bottom. Uh, you can see diffractions from this obvious normal fault, uh, asymmetric, right? That's coming off the top of the salt structure. Now you can see the fault offsets. Uh, you you don't have to trace the diffractions. Um, you know each one is located with each each uh, termination is located with a with an actual termination. No crisscrossing uh, diffractions to get in the way. You can see the complex uh, structure of the top of the salt. Okay. Without see how how broken up that gets, how many how the diffractions get in the way, so so basically we're we're remember migration uh, moves uh, uh, dip upward uh, moves reflectors up dip and steepens them, and it collapses diffractions. That's really what it's what it's for. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, and and notice to the flat reflectors nothing happened. Right, there's uh, there are migration artifacts in here. There's stacking artifacts in there, so uh, uh, you know there's there's plenty of problems. But you know the migration didn't do anything where the reflectors are flat. Okay, but it collapsed the diffractions uh, to uh, to terminations, and it uh, uh, you know moved the uh, uh, moved these reflections at the top of the salt up dip and it steepened them. And so that should be the uh, correct geometry now. Um, okay, so that's that's the uh, the essence of um, FK migration. You've got not one but but two, you know, practical, still in use migration methods today. I won't be able to keep up that pace, but uh, um, that's uh, uh, today's kind of a big day. <laughs>